1 Corinthians chapter 8. I just feel like I need to say, we now return to our regularly scheduled broadcast. <laughs> we took the month of March off, and we now return to 1 Corinthians. Surprisingly, you guys are still here. Remember I said at the outset of preaching through 1 Corinthians that most likely all of the church will either leave or kick me out. We're only in chapter 8. We've still got to get to chapter 16, so that could still happen. But 1 Corinthians has been a progressive development of Paul's argument on how Christians ought to live in light of the cross of Calvary. Paul had presented the problem to us that was at Corinth. And remember, the problem that was at Corinth was there was a distinct lack of unity. And what does this lack of unity lead to? Well, it leads to a, 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 a riotous living. It leads to an anything goes type mentality. And this is what Paul has been dealing with. He's been dealing with how the Corinthian church has been failing to mature in Jesus Christ. You see, this is the concept that needs to, to come upon you, is that when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you don't remain the person that you were. You don't remain the person that you were. The things that you once loved, the things that you once found near and dear to you, the things that were once important to you, that has to change. And it changes as you mature in Jesus Christ. So that's chapters 2 and 3 of 1 Corinthians. Paul says that Corinthians who have a cross-shaped perspective are maturing Corinthians. A cross-shaped perspective are maturing Corinthians. And so a lack of spiritual wisdom leads to grievous sins that Paul deals with in chapters 5 and 6. And he says the only way you can handle this, these grievous sins, the only way that you can deal with them is to recognize that you must pursue holiness. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you must pursue holiness. I was talking the other day with, uh, I, I got the opportunity to speak at the uh, Adult and Teen Challenge down in Cheswick, and I was talking with the campus pastor there, and he mentioned the name J.C. Ryle. And I remember being at a pastor's conference, and at the pastor's conference, the one pastor stood up and he said, if any of you young pastors do not know who J.C. Ryle is, then you need to get out of the ministry, go back home, and read Holiness of God. And until you've done that, you shouldn't preach another sermon. Because in J.C. Ryle's Holiness of God, he tears apart the concept that you can live however you want to live, you can act however you want to act, you can do whatever you want to do. It's all underneath this umbrella blanket term that's called Christian liberty and Christian freedom. And because you have liberty in Galatians, we're told, you know, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free. But people press this and they say, because I have liberty, that means I can now do whatever I want. J.C. Ryle says no. The scriptures say no. The scriptures say without holiness, no man shall see God. And so this is what Paul will continue to deal with as he sees the maturity of Christians at stake. So he talks about marriage matters. And Paul explains how a cross-shaped perspective allows you to handle your marriage. Stacy and I are celebrating 18 years tomorrow. 18 years of her being stuck with me. Can you imagine that? It's, it's always to my utter amazement that I wake up in the morning here on earth and not in glory with somebody telling me, you know, the way you went out is your wife finally held the pillow over your head. <laughs> 18 years. How do, you, how do you maintain a relationship with someone for 18 years? You look at each other through the cross. That's the only way. You look at each other through the cross. 
You recognize you've got shortfallings, I've got shortfallings, but we look at each other through the cross of Jesus Christ. If Jesus can love me, that's the mentality that Paul's dealing with. Now we've come to the third section of 1 Corinthians in chapter 8. And in the third section, Paul turns his attention over these next few chapters, 8, 9, 10, and 11. He turns to the concept of status, knowledge, freedom, and food offered to idols. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, pastor, I've always been looking forward to some great sermon preached on food offered to idols. I woke up this morning and thought to myself, when I come to church, I hope that the pastor preaches from 1 Corinthians 8 and talks with me about food offered to idols because that's the most pressing thought on every Christian in Catanning's mind today, right? You guys got up and you're like, man, just really lay out a great food offered to idols sermon. Okay, since you've asked, I will. I'll do the best that I can. Remember, there's been a portion of the Corinthian church that has been avidly touting the fact that they are superior spiritually. They know things. And because they know things, they're able to do certain things and live certain ways. And Paul has been taking the time over these previous seven chapters to show them that they didn't really know anything. They didn't really know anything. They had been seeking after a worldly, a sensual, a natural wisdom. And Paul says, the follower of Jesus Christ pursues spiritual wisdom. The follower of Jesus Christ pursues spiritual wisdom. So Paul is going to deal head on with the arrogance that the Christians at Corinth have and he explains to them that they must be willing to give up their arrogant attitude in light of the cross. Now this is a similar discussion that Paul has in Romans 14 to 15, but it's not the same. There he's dealing with a different concept of a weaker brother. Here the weaker brother that we're going to see this morning is the Gentile weaker brothers. But I want you to read 1 Corinthians chapter 8 beginning in verse 1. Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. This is free of charge, but this is to piggyback on the Trinity messages that we preached last month. That verse right there is an expansion of the Shema, which is Deuteronomy 6.4, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. And notice that the Apostle Paul expands the Shema for us to understand that the oneness of God is not negated by the threeness of God. He includes in this statement, he says that we know that there is one God and one Lord, Jesus Christ, who is the Christ, and we by him. He goes on and says, Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol, unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge, I believe...
balances knowledge and love. Knowledge without love is a stick that beats someone up with. You know that? You go up to somebody and you say, well, you just know. You ought to know this. Why aren't you in church? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you acting this way? And that's why so many people get turned off from Christianity is because there tends to be, uh, uh, let me just give you all of this knowledge without mixing it with any love. But all love is hypocrisy. Did you know that? If all knowledge is, is uh, just beating someone up, then all love is just hypocrisy. If all you are is just, oh, I just love this person so much. I don't care if they're doing anything wrong. I just love them. Let them live their life how they want to live. I just love them. I just want to love them. That's not balanced with knowledge. And so it becomes hypocrisy. So, what is the knowledge in question? Obviously, verse 4, the knowledge that's in question, is about gods and idols. Does this knowledge of gods and idols affect our eating habits? Well, the elite were saying, hey, let's eat anything because idols aren't real anyway. And the weaker brothers felt dirty eating everything or anything that's offered to false gods. Now, I believe that the implied third group that I mentioned earlier is the group that Paul would have been a part of. Paul knows that these idols are not gods, but yet he still abstains out of love for both the Lord and for the weaker brother. Christians, incidentally, are not supposed to look like the world. You're supposed to be able to tell the difference. When you look at the Christian, you're supposed to be able to tell that there's something significantly different in that person's life. The elite loved the finer things of the world, and they sought to justify their actions. I can't help but when I see guys like Kenneth Copeland or uh, um, what's, what's Smiley guy's name down in Texas? Osteen. When I see guys like this and I see them purporting this lifestyle that says, hey, you know, I can have this rich Lear jet and I can jet off from here to there and I can spend, you know, I, I'm a classmate. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but I'm a classmate with Benny Hinn's nephew. And he told me, he said that it was, it was not out of the ordinary for us to get in a plane and fly to Dubai on the pretense of doing ministry, but just to spend the night at a $10,000 a night hotel room because we could. That's not at all anything that relates to Christianity. That's not a Christian lifestyle. That's seeking hedonism. That's seeking the pleasures of self. That's seeking the pleasures of this world. And this is, this is where Christians begin to talk about gray areas. Have you ever heard a Christian say, well, that's a gray area in my life. And I think to myself, a well-developed theology gives you an understanding of how to deal with those so-called gray areas. So when somebody comes up to me and they say, well, pastor, I live my life this way or I do this, one of the common ones is, pastor, I don't go to church because, you know, it doesn't save you anyway. And so what are they doing? They're doing the same thing here. They're applying what they believe is knowledge without having the balance of the love for God. They're not recognizing that if God has redeemed you unto himself, then he is causing you to love what he loves and hate what he hates. And it's interesting to me when people try to try to justify their actions because all they're trying to do is seek their own pleasures. This is what I want to do. This is how I want to live. This is the path I want to walk. This is the place I want to go. These are the things that I want to watch. You've got pastors that are now recommending to marriage cu couple, married couples in marriage counseling, they're saying engage in watching pornography together because it will help spice up your life. What? This is asininity. This is the foolishness of the world. All they're trying to do is seek their own pleasures. When somebody says, it's okay for me to drink, listen, I tell you, you don't realize how quick it is from one beer to drunk. 
people who say this. It, it drives me up of a wall. When, when Christians say, well, pastor, it's okay to drink. Obviously, you didn't sit in a room and watch your dad beat your mom because he was drunk. You don't think about those things, do you? Well, pastor, it's okay for me to, uh, to watch these certain TV programs. Why? Why? If Jesus came down and said, hey, I want to sit with you and watch TV with you for the day, would you probably wind up just leaving it shut off? What am I saying? I'm saying that when we keep trying to justify our actions... When we keep trying to say, well, this is the way I do, this is the way I function, this is the way I live, because this is what pleases me. This is what makes me happy. It's not right. This, this is not what Paul's talking about. Paul is telling us that we should live exactly the opposite of this. We shouldn't love the things of this world so much that all we want to do is justify ourselves to achieve them. So knowledge alone puffs up. But knowledge mixed with love builds up. The church should always be sinking what builds up, not what blows up. Paul begins here to build to 1 Corinthians 13 and the longer discussion on love. But he has shown us already the importance of loving God. But here he begins to show us the importance of loving each other. Loving God shows that we are known by God, verses 2 and 3 explain to us. The Corinthians think that a simple knowledge is, en is enough. Plus, they believe that their theology is unassailable. After all, it's built on the Shema. There's one God. There's no other gods. We can eat meat offered to idols. We can live it up at temple worship. It's not real. It's all just pretend anyway. Your knowledge, this side of heaven, you must recognize, is never perfect. Did you hear that? It's funny how statements like that don't ever get an amen. Your knowledge, this side of heaven, is never perfect. Pastor Kaminsky said to me, he said, Brother, he said, why are you going on to get your doctorate? He said, do you want this church to give you a doctorate? He said, we'll just slap an honorary doctorate on your door. I said, the reason why I'm going on is because this one thing I know, I'm an idiot. And I am in a constant pursuit of trying to rectify that status. A constant pursuit of trying to rectify that status. The Corinthians think that they know something, but they prove that they know nothing. They believe that their knowledge is perfect on this side of heaven. And Paul says, you don't know what you think you know. There is always a testing of your knowledge. And the base test of your knowledge is found in loving God. Your love for the Lord, can I say it this way? Your love for the Lord is an authenticator of who you really are. Your love for the Lord is an authenticator of who you really are. And it's shown by your love for what he loves. Well, in verses 4 to 6, he begins to examine knowledge. Now, I take the position that verse 4 is the elitist position. I believe, again, that Paul is quoting what the Corinthians had said. Now, some say, no, it doesn't really affect your, uh, your end result and your, your her hermeneutic, depending on which position you take. But I think that the Corinthian position is this. Well, since there's only one God, what does it matter if we eat meat that's offered to false gods? And I think Paul's position is found for us in verses 5 to 6. For though there be they that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be many gods and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Paul's careful. How does he begin verse 6? But to us. That's important. Just because we believe does not negate the fact that the world's belief is radically different than ours. Did you know that? Just because you believe in Jesus Christ doesn't mean that Joe Schmo down the street or Joe Sixpack who walks in, into the bar has any knowledge that's, that's separate from yours. Nor does it negate the fact that there are demons 
kids out there. Paul will build to that by the time we get to chapter 10. So there's a twofold understanding here. One, the entire world was wrapped up in idol worship. The entire world is wrapped up in idol worship. The Greco-Roman culture is built on the belief of this pantheon of gods. There is a god for every little thing. The multiplying of gods was supposed to be the evidence to the Greco-Roman culture that there were multiple gods. So you have a god who is for agriculture, you have a god who is for fertility, you have a god who is for war, you have a god who is for wisdom, you, have, you, know, you name it, and they, they put a god to it. But I think actually that the multiplying of gods proves the frailty of humanity. I think when humans say, well, we've got to have a God for this, and we've got to have a God for that, and we've got to have a God that takes care of this, and we've got to have a God that explains that, I think it just shows how weak human thinking is. Paul's position is very different. His position is there is one Lord. Secondly, there is a host of demons who use idols to demean and destroy people. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to go into a country with idols, but it was interesting to me when we went to Japan how there were certain things that you could and could not do in certain areas because of certain idols that were present there. And it's almost got a stranglehold on the community. We don't understand that because we live in America, although the idols of America that we are setting up are starting to destroy us as we seek to worship at them. But Paul's argument is clear. The Corinthian elitist thinks that he knows, but he hasn't fully tested his knowledge. Again, I don't believe that Paul is ever condoning a life that promotes idol worship. I believe that Paul is saying, Christians, you are to be different. Different. Your life is not to promote the wickedness of this world. As a part of his family, your life is to be clearly different than the rest of this world. So I remember, I remember walking with my kids when my uncle used to keep horses. Uh, in the field behind our house and we take care of the cemetery and we have to walk down the road to get to the cemetery and as you walk down the road there's a fence that's right alongside of you and you know what the fence is? They call it an electric fence. <laughs> Why do they call it an electric fence? Because it's got electricity in it. And you walk with kids down the road and it would astound me how the kids would want to walk as close to the electric fence as they could possibly walk. And they would just be like, I mean, I don't know if you ever took a golden rod, you ever take like snap a golden rod and walk along with an electric fence with it and it builds the charge up. You know, that's how you know you're a hick when you used to run around and do stuff like that as a kid. My kids, and I remember telling them, you've got the whole road to walk on. You've got the whole field to play in. Why do you have to hang out near the electric fence? And I thought to myself, that's Christians. Christians are constantly trying to lean back over the fence into the world. You have the whole field of Christianity to run in. Why are you trying to justify your actions by trying to hang out at the fence? So then finally in verses 7 to 13, there is a knowledge that has consequences. The first thing that we see in verse 7 is that the abuse of knowledge may draw recent converts into sin. Howbeit, there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Now, what does the word conscience mean? I think we have to understand this. Paul is rejecting the concept that there's some sort of universal knowledge. And then he goes on and he says, not only is there not a universal knowledge, but there is also a conscience that is at stake here. I, I, the, the concept of conscience was being developed in the Greek world. And our view of conscience as something that gives us a, a moral choosing between right and wrong is something that was developed, I believe, after the Apostle Paul wrote. I believe what he's talking about here is a sense of identity, where you belong at. 
And he's saying that these Christians are supposed to belong and find their identity in Jesus Christ. These new believers are supposed to find their identity in Jesus Christ. But if they eat at the table of idols, how is it different from before? How has anything changed? I remember the song that, uh, that, that George Yance used to sing. I went back to the house where I used to live. And my little boy ran and hid behind the door. And I said to him, son, we don't live here anymore thanks to Calvary. Thanks to Calvary, things are different than they used to be. Thanks to Calvary, they're not like they were before. But if your life post-Jesus continues to reflect the principles with which you lived pre-Jesus then the question I have is, do you even know Jesus? And furthermore, the more important question is, does Jesus even know you? Because there will be many in that day, Matthew's Gospel tells us, that will cry out, Lord, Lord. And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. You. These people lacked an awareness of who they were in Christ early on. And that awareness could be easily influenced by others who tout themselves to be spiritually mature. So Paul says, out of your love for these brothers who lack this awareness of where they belong, why would you want to eat idol food? He goes on in verse 8 and says, it's not even advantageous to you. But meat commendeth us not to God. You're not superior in Christ just because you say, look, I can have meat that's offered to an idol. What you eat does not prove your standing. And food will neither increase nor reduce your standing in Jesus Christ. Because the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And eating idol food is definitely a heart issue. The food itself is irrelevant. Paul will later on go on to say, don't ask. Don't ask where food is from because lest your conscience become involved in it and you have to say no. If you're sitting down at a meal with somebody and they're offering food to you, don't ask them if it's been offered at an, at an, at an, an idol's temple because then what happens? Then you have to take a stand. You have to say, no, I can't eat this. He's saying it's not the food, it's the heart that's at play here. But he goes on to explain to us that just because we have liberty, it does not mean that we should have a destructive liberty. It does not mean that we have the right to eat food and boast about it. Look at me, I ate a Zeus cake this morning. Doesn't that prove my freedom in Jesus Christ? No, it doesn't. Why would you bring it up? And Paul has already said what? We, we need only turn back a page, at least in my Bible, to 1 Corinthians 6 and in verse 9. And he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither idolat or fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But we've been changed. Why? Because we've been washed. We are sanctified. We're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. We're never to presume when we read passages like that, we're never to presume that it's saying, well, I'm not that person anymore. Be careful lest you deceive yourself. Every time you read passages like this, you're supposed to say, am I somebody who is trying to play at this? Because liberty is destructive. And this type of liberty that the Corinthians were, were dealing in is a liberty that leads to one of those big words. Antinomianism. What does that mean? Anti means against. Nomos is the law against the law. It leads to a type of thinking that says, well, there's no law. I can live it up. I can live it however I want to live it. But we have been given the law of Christ. It has been written on our hearts for those of us who are redeemed. 
Can I put it to you this way? No New Testament writer ever views liberty as an excuse for sin. No New Testament writer ever views liberty as an excuse for sin. Eating idle food is not a right. That's what Paul's saying. It's not a right that has been given to you because you have liberty. He says, let me tell you what eating idle food is. It's a stumbling block. It's a stumbling block. It's a place on which other Christians can, be get, can get themselves tripped up on. It's an identifying with the world and its evil lusts. This action, verse 10 to 11, is actually even more than that. It's a destructive action. What do they say? Come, eat with me at the idol temple. Now, I don't believe that verse 11, when it says, and through the knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. I don't believe that this, is, that this is a question of salvation or losing your salvation, even though some try to make this an argument. I think that what it is, is it's, it's a part of the broader conversation that Paul has on love. What's the broader conversation that he has on love? He's saying, is this the way you really want to live your life? That somebody watches you living in sin and they think this is okay for me to live in sin and it leads to their destruction. Is that really loving God and loving your brother? The answer should be no. How does Paul conclude it? He says, man, I would rather never eat another bite of meat again than be a stumbling block to somebody else. Now, I don't know if the Apostle Paul is like me, but I like meat. That's like my favorite dish. You asked Stacy, I said to her the other day, she made me steak and potatoes. That's life. I could eat that breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Same meal. Same meal. You give me a baked potato and a little cut of steak, I could eat it three times a day. Just in the morning, just throw an egg on top of the steak, and then it'd be breakfast. I like meat. You go to my get-togethers on my dad's side of the family, we joke about it there. What are we going to have? The kids will say to me, what are we going to have, Dad? What are we going to eat? And I said, meat. And, <laughs> well, what else are we going to have? A side of meat. I mean, Granddad will make brisket, and then he will make sausage, and then he will make hot dogs for the kids. <laughs> and by the time you're done, you're thinking to yourself, man, I, does anybody have any cholesterol medication? But yet here's Paul who's saying, I'm willing to give all of that up. Now, if you're a vegan and say you're willing to give up meat, that's really not showing anything. It's like they sent to us in the mail the other day, they sent to us, by mistake, hair gel. And Stacy had the nerve to say to me, did you buy this? <laughs> Thanks, dear. <laughs> but I, if you are a person who loves meat, you ought to be willing to give it up just so that your brother or sister in Christ can grow and not be led into a destructive identity crisis. What Corinth thought they knew was wrong. We as Christians ought to be prepared to give up things in order that we can help converts find their identity in Jesus Christ. And I, I thought I'd just conclude with this question. Where is your identity found? This morning. Well, three minutes passed into the afternoon. Where is your identity found? Is it found in Jesus if your identity is found in Jesus, then we sing a hymn about that. They'll know you're a Christian by your love. Amen? Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the word. We thank you for even the word that smacks us around as the Apostle Paul so often does. We pray, Father, that we would be encouraged by it. We pray, Father, that we would be blessed by it. But most of all, Father, we pray that we would be changed by it. It's not enough to just be warmed on the outside, but might, might we be burning on the inside for the truths that you've given us. 
We pray this in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen.